Hey everyone, just letting you know about a podcast that I listen to all the time. It's called Famous Lost Words. It's created by two really good friends of mine, Tom Jokic and Christopher Ward. It's a podcast that features long lost interviews with incredible musical artists all throughout the ages in all different genres. I personally guarantee that you will enjoy every single episode as much as I do. Once again, it's called Famous Lost Words and it's available wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Women in the Music Industry, the podcast that shines a spotlight on the remarkable women who are breaking barriers and making their mark in an industry that has long been dominated by men. I'm your host, Rob Wells, and I'm thrilled to have you join us on this empowering journey. Each episode of this podcast will be dedicated to exploring the inspiring stories, accomplishments, and struggles of the extraordinary women who have defied the odds and made waves in the music business. Together, we'll delve into the journeys of female artists, songwriters, producers, musicians, managers, executives, and all those who have helped play a pivotal role behind the scenes. We'll uncover the stories that deserve to be heard, as well as celebrate the triumphs, challenges, and unique perspectives that women bring to the music industry. Whether you're a fan of music, an aspiring artist, or simply curious about the inner workings of the music business, this podcast will offer a valuable perspective. Together, we'll celebrate the power of music and the strength of these inspiring women. So join us as we amplify their voices and together pave the way for a future where women in the music business are no longer the exception, but the rule. Today's podcast is sponsored by The Songwriter's Piano, an easy-to-use app for songwriters and lyricists to use when coming up with song ideas when there's no instrument around or nobody to play one. With the Songwriter's Piano, one can easily play commonly used pop songwriting chord sequences at the touch of a screen, in any key, in three different chord variations, all played on a gorgeously recorded grand piano. Download the Songwriter's Piano by Play Like Me apps today, found on both iOS and Android stores everywhere. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Women in the Music Industry. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome to the podcast. For those of you who have been here before, welcome back. My guest today is none other than my good friend and alternative dark pop singer, songwriter, and recording artist, Tess Posner. Woohoo, Tess. Hello. How are you? I'm doing great. So great to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm so happy that you're here. This is great. Um, I'm so excited as well that you're here and I, I can't wait to dive into this. I'm going to go a little bit further into your bio right now um, because Tess is known for taking the listener on a journey into the realms of the subconscious to shine a light on the hidden parts of ourselves left behind. I could almost just stop the bio right there. I mean, like that's, that's <laughs> pretty cool right there. Pretty amazing. Her revelatory lyrics and enchanting sonic landscapes invite the listener on a journey inside to self-discovery and healing. She weaves together mesmerizing piano, ethereal synths, and dynamic orchestral elements together with her lush vocal harmonies that lay over a bed of deep-sounding drums and bass. Her 2023 release, Alchemy, has climbed to over 500,000 streams on Spotify and surpassed 1 million views on TikTok. Holy smokes, that's great. Uh, Her song, Volcano, was a finalist in both the USA Songwriting and Songwriters Universe competitions. That is crazy. Her song, Feral Child, was a semifinalist in the International Songwriting Competition. That's also awesome. So great. That's really difficult to achieve. Uh, there's, there's so many people that are, that are, uh, you know, applying for, for, for all of that just to, to get into the finalist position or semifinalist position. And you achieved finalist and semifinalist. That's, that's so great. Um, Tess says that alchemy represents that process of transmuting painful parts of our past and feelings into a kind of gold that fuels meaning and healing. Tess Posner's past projects have clocked over 3.5 million streams on Spotify to date, with one single, Ocean, hitting over 1 million streams. Her past releases have garnered significant press, including The Clash magazine, Ear Milk, Yahoo News, Tongue Tied magazine, Pop Music, Pop Dust, The Digital Fix, The California Herald, Surviving the Golden Age, Queen City Sounds, and The Girls at the Rock Show. 
She's been featured and charting high on multiple radio stations across the U.S. and Canada. She has played San Francisco venues and festivals, including Serenity Festival, The Lost Church, The Knockout, and performs weekly for her global community on the live streaming platform Twitch. Tess has a background working in nonprofits that focus on gender and racial equity. In 2024, she also co founded Venus Music Showcases in 2024 to highlight women and gender expansive individuals in the music industry. Tess Posner, we are not worthy to have you. This is amazing. You've done so much, and I can't believe you've carved out a bit of time to be here. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful that you had me. Thank you so much. Oh, pleasure. Pleasure. Um, I have known you for two, three years, something like that. Right yeah, maybe. There? Yeah, around three, maybe, I think. Yeah. You and I met uh, through the Songwriting Academy. Yes. Um, which uh, was a, a great, great place to to meet uh, mentors and students, uh, putting people together, and um, um, you know, trying to help each other with our with our journeys and try to give advice on certain things, songwriting aspects, production aspects. But I remember, you know, there's certain students that you just really click with right away, and you for sure were one of them. I just remember just really get along, along with you famously, and just being really blown away by the songs that you were writing and everything that you were doing so it's um yeah i just you know that that's how we met but now i know that there's so much more um to you and and there's so much before that happened before the songwriting academy that i'd, I'd love to dive into that and learn about how you got into all of this and what the first spark was musically with you and, and just where it all started if you could take me back a few years yeah absolutely thank you so much and yeah you're such an amazing mentor at the Songwriting Academy. It was, I was so blown away by your advice and your, your, I think they had workshops and stuff that you did, but it was incredible experience. And I'm so grateful to be sitting here now talking, having this conversation and to have worked with you. So thank you so much. I owe you a lot of money for saying that now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm free for hire anytime, really. That's right. I'll that's tell right. anyone that you're awesome. I, <laughs> just, I just need you in my life to just always be following me around wherever I go and just, just, just keep saying that stuff. It's, a, it's great for the ego. I happily will. I'll tell anyone that listens. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think my journey with music started really young and I was singing mostly in spiritual settings in choirs growing up. And that was such an incredible experience because in many cases, I was able to witness not only this almost transcendent power of music, but what happens when voices come together. So I would, I was little, so I would do like background harmonies <laughs> at the time. Um, but I got to like be around a bunch of musicians and see them kind of putting together the arrangements and singing these really beautiful songs and creating an experience for people. So I think my first connection to music was this sense of it taking people on a journey to something higher than themselves. And I, I can see now how what I'm doing, my vision and for my art, like so comes from that place of creating this journey for people to explore, you know, their emotions, their feelings, but also something much bigger. And then when I was about 11 or 12, um, I started really getting into singing and my parents bought me a karaoke machine. <laughs> so it was my first time like having the mic to myself and I would go in my room and just sing for hours and hours. Um, at the time, our friend, family friend gave us a their old piano because they were moving. And so I started to just pick up the piano kind of by ear and play around and I became obsessed. I was like, I want to go into music. Like I'm going to be a singer. I have proof of this in my like diary from an 11 year old that says, I want to be a singer someday. Um, so awesome. I was just really into it. And I actually studied classical guitar in high school. I went to kind of an alternative high school that was, uh, really focused on project-based alternative education um, from Massachusetts. And one of the teachers like had a classical guitar class. So I took that and it was hard. It was hard. Um, a lot of technical stuff, but really gave me a good foundation in music. 
But around that same time, I actually had a mentor kind of discourage me from going to going into music, which is unfortunate. And I think she was totally trying to help me. But she basically said, you know, this is a cutthroat industry. Like, it's really not about the music. It'll I think she said something like chew you up and spit you out or something. Oh, no. So someone with, I, someone with a bad experience, clearly. Yeah, totally. And I really empathize with that now. But at the time I was like, ooh, that doesn't sound good. So even though I kept music as like this this dream inside my heart that was kind of buried in there, I ended up pursuing nonprofit work and going into um really this mission of trying to bring empowerment to especially um in the in the issues of like race racial and gender equity which was something i was really passionate about but music always kind of stayed this background thing that i would always dream about so about seven or eight years ago um i was working with a vocal coach and just for fun <laughs> and she was like have you ever tried writing songs? And I was like, no, I couldn't do that. I don't have anything to say. Um, and she actually gave me this advice, which was to write stream of consciousness right when you wake up, just like scribble down whatever comes to you and do that right when you get up because your mind isn't as active, your critical mind. So you're just kind of like flowing with it and then don't look at it. And then six weeks later, pull it out and see what's there. And when I read that, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like I thought I didn't have anything to write about. I have so much to write about. It was like this waterfall exploding or maybe more like a volcano. <laughs> <laughs> An appropriate uh, choice of, of terms. Yes, exactly. So it was really this revelation to me. And even though I'd been doing this work that to me was really important, and I'm so passionate about doing kind of like active work to make the world a better place. I suddenly realized that there is this tremendous healing potential in music as well. And especially with songwriting, because you can reach people's hearts and reach people's emotions in a way that can be so healing and music can reach people where nothing else can. So it was a long journey of trying to wrestle with like, okay, I'm falling in love with music. I'm falling in love with songwriting. I'm being called back to this thing that I wanted to do when I was 12 years old and was led away, but I have this whole other career. So it took me a little bit to actually wrestle with that and make the leap that I was going to really pursue music as a career. So that's kind of around the same time I joined the songwriting Academy and met you and then just um, a little over two years ago, made the decision to go for it. So here we are. And wow. it's been amazing. It's been the best decision that I've made, really. Now, prior to the Songwriting Academy, you, you had released material already on Spotify? Or were you starting to release right around the same time as you joining the Songwriting Academy? Yeah, I had started releasing. So the first um, EP that I released was in December of 2018. And... That was my first set of songs. I was kind of releasing singles here and there while I was kind of working full time, this other job. And then, uh, yeah, a couple of years later, I decided to, that was five years ago, I guess, or no. Yeah, about five years ago. And then maybe two years in, I decided to join the Songwriting Academy to really try to improve my skills because of how much I was falling in love with the art of songwriting. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool that your, your day job was something that you were also passionate about. You know, you weren't doing something that was a complete, just, you know, j just to pay the bills. It was something that, that you were really interested in. And I say this all the time, nothing is ever wasted, you know, even in a job that you can't stand, um, you still take some of that forward with you. Some, some things that you learn from that. Um, do you find that, that, um, your, your work that you were doing outside of music, do you find that that comes into your songwriting at all in, in your, in, in the way that you write or the subject matter that you choose to write about? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think, um, so originally I went to school for social work and was working in the mental health field. And then I started to work more in, um, education and workforce development, helping people find jobs and get into, 
um, really great educational experiences for empowerment and economic mobility. Um, but I've always really, really been passionate about mental health and healing. And that's partially from my own journey as well. And a lot of what I've experienced in my work, as well as personally and in my own family, is about people kind of being isolated or being lost from either connections to support or to help or to um, themselves, really, like feeling kind of lost from themselves. And so pretty much all of my songs, I'd say, cover this theme around reclaiming, reconnecting, finding a part of yourself that was lost. As you read at the beginning, that was kind of um, the be very, very beginning of the bio is, is about, you know, empowering yourself, reconnecting, healing these pieces, these lost pieces. And, you know, whether or not I was working in the mental health space or dealing with my own experience, I think those themes have come up. And I certainly think that um, it's also what I've experienced doing the work in this field of just like needing to put the pieces back together and bring people together and connect people is, is a really potent force of healing in, uh, in the work that I was doing and in the music as well. I remember as a kid, always being dragged to church because my dad was a church minister and we would go every Sunday and I would kick and scream before we would go, you know, cause I wanted to do other things. I wanted to go play with friends or go out and play outside or whatever. I didn't want to go and sit in church, but I do remember when I finally got to church and I sat there um, that I would see, you know, my dad up there giving a sermon and, and, and I would connect somehow with the sermon and I would see other people around me connecting with it as well and getting some meaning out of it and getting some sort of like energy to, to go forward throughout the rest of the week and be able to live through, through their life for, for, mm. for that, for that week. And I just remember at the end of it, just thinking, this feels really good. This feels really positive. And, and, and as much as I was kicking and screaming to go to church, I find that in my music, I try to do the same thing. I try to give a message that's in the song that helps somebody that makes them feel like after they've heard this song that they can go forward and live through the week with, with a bit more strength or a bit more positivity. And, and, and just like, I get that same feeling when I'm done writing the song where I just feel like this feels good. This feels really good. I feel like I'm doing something that is helping humanity in, in one way or another. And that's, I never want to be involved in a song that, that takes a negative spin. Um, you know, that, that doesn't mean that I, I never write about dark things, but the dark songs end up being songs of service as well, because they, they sort of let somebody else know that they're not alone, that they're, that they're going through the same thing that, that they are and, and, uh, and, and that there's somebody out there that understands what they're going through as well. It's interesting how all these little things that we go through, how they just sort of creep into, to what we do creatively, isn't it? Totally. That's beautifully said. I love that. And that's one of the reasons I love working with you because I think, and a lot of music is like that, you know, it gives people permission to feel things that they might feel alone in feeling. And so even if it is a dark song, it it's allowing them to express that. And it's so important to give that permission for ourselves to feel. And yeah, I think it's all about like my songs are about, <laughs> you know, I laugh because it's like they're pretty dark. But at the same time, I feel like it's that idea of alchemy that we were talking about before, where if you're willing to face what is dark, if you're willing to go to the depths of pain, you'll find your strength, you'll find what lesson is in there for you to kind of alchemize that pain into empowerment, or into a lesson or into learning. And I really feel like my own struggles in my life, whether it's with mental health issues, or etc, whatever I've gone through, there's always this ability that I've learned over time to kind of bring alchemy to it and not resist going into the pain. And I feel like that's where the real healing can happen mm -hmm. and where music can be so powerful because it can allow you to travel into those dark caves in a way that other types of things make it really hard. And for some reason, music just 
it like reaches in. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. what makes it so magical. It can, it can kind of reach those places that are scary that people don't want to go to. It's so true. If I think about where the majority of my life lessons have come from, the majority of them are from movies and music, from watching movies and, and seeing stories that, that were so powerful that, you know, emotionally or, or, or just, just little life lessons that you can learn in that. Obviously, I learned a lot from my parents as well and the experiences that I've had in growing up. But, but the majority of things like the big revealing moments in my life are definitely from things that I learned from movies and music, from, from entertainment, really carefully crafted stories that just really make an impact on you when you watch. And humans are built around storytelling. Like stories have been around as long as humanity has, you know, the oral tradition of passing down these like myths or these stories or these cultural um, myths or family stories, right? It's all about story because that's kind of how we almost work things out in ourselves or something where we we see it in others and we see even though it's a particular story that isn't ours there's something universal about humanity that's being showcased and then we resonate and we feel like we're going through that journey on some level it's helping us process things or to learn about what being human is all about which yeah, music is such a powerful way of telling a story. You have the lyrics, but also the music itself and the kind of journey of the song. It's, it gets me so excited. <laughs> and if you do it right, you can achieve that in three minutes in a song, yeah. which clearly you are because, I mean, you, you have become a finalist in songwriting competitions. Um, your songs are getting out there. They're reaching out to people. You have 500,000 streams on just this album alone, just your latest album. And then, and then 3.5 million streams on your other music beyond that. Um, clearly you're doing something right. You're, you're, you're writing something, you're writing material that connects with people and is really making an, an impact. Let, let me ask you, what was it like when your music first came out? Was it scary at the beginning? Like when you started to release and then did you start to notice that, oh, there's people actually paying attention. There's, there's people listening to one of these songs or two of these songs or the whole record. And, and then you start seeing your streaming numbers going up. What's that experience like releasing your first material and then seeing the reaction? Whew, yes, that's a great question. Um, and thank you for the kind words. I appreciate that. I mean, when I first started releasing, I was absolutely terrified, like beyond measure, because I was writing about such personal things that I felt like it was, you know, the, mo- the more personal and specific we can be in the writing, the more universal it can become, or if it's really vague and kind of out there, it doesn't necessarily hit somebody. So I did feel like it was important for me to be vulnerable, that that's a lot of where the good art comes from. Um, but I was terrified because in my other work life identity, I was not, you know, when you're working in the, I guess, business world, you could call it, you're kind of putting on a certain facade and you're not showing emotion that much. You're not revealing your deepest truths. Like the artist is asked to strip naked in front of everyone (laughs) in a way that in other parts of the, you know, working world, you're really not doing at all. In fact, that would be like totally weird. (laughs) No, you have walls everywhere you go, basically like protection, right? But when you're an artist, it is so vulnerable. Yes. Sorry. Continue, please. No, exactly. The walls, that's really well said. And it's so terrifying to, to do that. So I think what really helped me get more courage to do it, because it still feels that way. It's not like, oh yeah, I did it then. And now I'm perfectly fine. I think I'm learning how to strip away even more layers. And every time I do that, people resonate more is what I find. Um, Like my song, Feral Child that you mentioned and that we worked on together, which was such an incredible pleasure. And you helped bring that to where it went. Um, That's one thing we we, we haven't mentioned yet is that I I, (laughs) so lucky to, to, to work with you on that record. And, and I thank you so much for, for, for bringing me on. It's uh that was a great experience working with you. And I'm such a fan of you and, and you as a human, but you as a musician and, and as a songwriter and a singer and, and all of that, it was just such a pleasant experience working with you. 
minus the the various sicknesses that happened during <laughs> uh during the making of that record it was insane it was like the whole world was against us in one way or another or or viruses were against us or volcanoes were against us or something <laughs> there's just there there was something crazy going on but we actually you know persevered and 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 got that record out somehow we did no it was amazing working with you because i felt like we had a great time and it was really fun and I felt like we were both so excited about what we were creating and really wanted to do the best for the music that it um, it worked really well just on a like musical collaboration level. And I'd give anyone the advice, like, don't settle for less than that, because working with Rob has been a revelation of just like what's possible when you find the right collaborators. And it's so important. Um, but yeah, I got COVID right as I was going to record. You had illnesses in your family. Like my power went out. Your power went out. <laughs> yeah. It was totally crazy. Oh, it was just nuts. I think you got COVID twice, right? Twice in a row? I got one of the rebound cases. So it was oh, like <laughs> two weeks later, sick again. And I couldn't sing. Like, yeah, it delayed it all. But there you go. It's all about the alchemy because I ended up being isolated in my room like rewriting some of the lyrics and i think the songs were better because of that so i don't know it's like you make the best of it and you figure out you learn to flow with the timing <laughs> absolutely so you release your first record and how long after do you start seeing uh information coming back to you that people are responding to to the to the music i mean right away because you know spotify like the second day, you can be like, oh, wow, people are listening. So I had one song in particular on that EP that people responded to. And then I just was like, I'm, I'm obsessed. Like this is because to me, it's sort of like I, I feel like I'm, I'm not even writing the music. And I know we've talked about this as well, but like it's kind of coming through me. And I kept feeling like, oh, there's these more is coming through me. And I feel like I'm giving service to something bigger than myself, um, which I think makes it a lot easier to do what an artist does because it's not about me. It's like, I'm like the next song, one of the next songs that I really released is called Supernova, which is about a woman who is escaping domestic abuse and the conflict that she has about that. And, you know, it's not my story, but it's so many women's stories. And Supernova is about her finding this power and this strength and this resilience. And I can't tell you how many women wrote to me and said, that song like reached me in this situation. And when I hear that, I'm just like, I don't care how hard this is. I have to keep doing it because I know that, you know, whatever this is that I'm channeling through can, can help people. So I think that's where I really got obsessed in those early days is just seeing that, wow, this can really reach people if I am willing to go there and be vulnerable and kind of share these things that other people don't want to, it can help. And even if it helps that one person, like it makes the whole thing worth it. So yeah, those early days were really about me just kind of telling myself to go for it and realizing that it is about something bigger than myself and that that makes this risk that I'm taking worth it. Interesting. I love when you said that it comes through you. And and I had this image almost of like, um, what is the thing that, 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 that used in like the, the gold rush days where they would put a pan in the, in the stream mm. and, and just let the water go through. But then what would collect on there was like little flecks of gold that would just be there. Is that a sifter? Is that, is that what it's called? Is that or a sieve maybe? Yeah. Something like that. I should know this. I live in this like area where they used to do gold panning. <laughs> yeah. But, it, but it's kind of like that, right? It's just like all this information that's going through you and you just, you've got your pan there to collect all the good stuff, like the stuff where it comes along and you're like, Oh, that's pretty cool. That sounds like a song. Totally. It's really just living life, isn't it? And just being open and receptive to all the things that are coming through. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a beautiful image. I'm not going to, I'm not going to forget that one. Thank you for that. No problem. Um, so you're, you're getting, you know, interest happening on, on your songs. You're getting messages of feedback saying that these songs mean so much to people. This is great. Um, 
are you starting to perform live uh, at this moment or you're starting to think about doing a tour or just like local shows? How, how does, how does that uh, start to, to happen in your life? Yeah, I've just started. So it started with actually my album release um, show, the first live show that I played since before the pandemic started. And that was amazing experience. I love performing live because it's really that connection that you can make with people and that feeling of unity almost where you get with people at a live show is so amazing to be able to channel that energy live and connect around these songs is such a exhilarating experience. And actually last week I was um, invited because of the song Volcano to go to Austin during South by Southwest and perform at the USA songwriting competition um, showcase. So that, that was a huge honor. You got to tell me about that whole experience. Like that's huge being asked to go to South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. That's great. That's great. Yeah. How long ago did you find out about that? Oh my gosh. I think it was like only like a month and a half ago. Um, Cause I found out that Volcano was a finalist and then they were like, Oh, you should come to Austin to perform with our showcase. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I have to do this. This will be my first time performing outside of California. Wow. But it feels really important to do for the sake of the song and just for the experience. So I went last week. That's great. Was it just you playing keys or did you bring people? Did you bring musicians? Did you hire anybody on the site? Yeah, my friend plays guitar and lives in Austin. So he played with me. Perfect. And it was super fun to do like these kind of acoustic guitar versions of all the songs. Um, different vibe but it worked really well and it was right on the river and there were these trees in the background and wow it was a great experience austin is such a cool city it's kind of like this bubble in the middle of texas isn't it that just feels very different than the rest of texas but it's it's just it's yeah. it's cool and what a vibe being at south by southwest with all this music going on i went there one time and and uh we played a show with with, with a band that i was in and it was just so cool it was so much fun and, and the whole city just felt alive bustling oh with my music gosh. so much good music everywhere it's like you can't look and in any direction and there's like 20 different things happening yeah it's kind of overwhelming but amazing absolutely i remember going to see uh, michael franti one night because oh, he, was, he was doing nice. a big show at south by southwest and that was that was incredible that was that was totally worth it uh for sure going going all the way there and and being a part of that so cool what is the difference between recording a record and performing live I, I, would, I would think it's almost like the same as you know acting on film and acting in theater almost oh yeah it's so different i mean when you're recording you're in such an isolated experience because you're just like in the vocal booth it's totally quiet especially your vocal booth Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen a vocal booth quite like yours. It's so great. It's like the it's like a crypt almost. It's it's just this this uh, black rectangle that that you're that you're in, and uh, but it does the job. It, it totally drowns out everything else around you. But it's yeah, it really uh, does. Yeah, it's 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 always amazing seeing you getting in and getting out <laughs> of your vocal booth. <laughs> but it's portable, right? It's portable. Yeah. It's like you can set it up in 15 minutes and you have your vocal booth. It's just a black, black box, basically. Yeah. It's cool. Whatever it takes, right? Whatever it takes. Whatever I've done some takes. crazy vocal recording sessions where it's, you know, in, in a closet where, where everyone's in the closet and we're all surrounded by clothes, a big walk-in <laughs> closet. And, and you've got the mic sort of sandwiched between two sweaters and, and all that, but, but whatever it takes exactly. to get that nice dead sound. Yeah, no, exactly. The dead sound. And also in a recording situation, you have multiple takes, whereas of course, if you're live, there's this pressure that you're just doing it and no matter what happens. And that used to freak me out, I think, when I had more fear around it. And now it's such an electrifying experience because it's really just about like making this connection to the audience and I kind of try to let go of trying to be perfect. I do all the work to practice and make sure I have everything like muscle memory so that it's right there. But then actually on stage, just letting all of that go and trying to like make eye contact with people in the room and really like offering, like I do this little prayer before each show and it's like, 
I offer this performance to the highest good of all people because it's like these songs are about healing and empowerment. So I want to just be the vehicle for that. And I feel like that puts me in a really good headspace because I'm not thinking about like, how do I look? What am I doing? Like, am I awkward? Or, you know, it can get really, oh, if you overanalyze it, you'll get like overwhelmed or anxious. Mm-hmm. So I'm just like, whatever. I'm letting this go to something higher. And if this is about the songs and I'm just a vehicle for that. Amazing. And do you play everything live or do you ever play with tracks at all? How does that work? I used to play with tracks. Um, and I found that it wasn't as energizing for me. So more recently I've had different band configurations. Um, I had a, a pretty large group play with me for my release show where it was like, two guitarists and a drummer and it was really fun because it was just like so so much energy behind me to like dance and get really into it and then i played with just the keys you know accompanying myself i've played with like one guitar player so i've done different configurations but i definitely like live instruments mm-hmm. for live it's so much better like if, if there's anything that ever goes wrong at least you can improvise you can you can always you know, say, let's do that part again, or let's, let's, let's keep it going. Whereas with tracks, it, it is what it is. And the song ends when it ends and there's no, you know, there's no going back to, to, to fix anything or to improvise at all. You just, you're a slave to the, to the tracks. Exactly. Yeah. yeah oh, I know. I I, <clears throat> I've had some terrible situations with tracks playing live that it's just, once you play uh, really, truly live, it, it, it's just, it's so much more fun. So much more fun. You can really just like change things up from night to night as well. You know, you can build up intensity. You can almost be a conductor. You yourself, you can be like, let's make this moment really loud. Let's now let's bring it down and everyone can just follow along and just, you can really sort of like, I guess, play more with the audience and and just see how the audience is reacting. Do they want it quieter? Do they want it louder? What's really working for them? Uh, Whereas with tracks, you just can't, it it, it is what it is with tracks. Yeah. Yeah. I agree live, with that hundred percent. Yeah. Live is just, just so much more fun. So here's one thing I'm curious about. <clears throat> Your sound is very particular. Were there any artists that you grew up listening to that sort of, as you heard them, you just thought, wow, what they're doing is exactly what I would like to be doing. And has it been sort of like a merging of different artists styles that, that come together in order to create your style? That's a great question. I think You know, I was definitely influenced a lot by classical music because I studied classical guitar and I also studied classical um, singing in and kind of choral music in college. And so growing up, I listened to like, I would call it mysterious music, which was like piano ballads on the way to school. (laughs) Mysterious music. (laughs) I'd say, Dad, can you put on the mysterious music? (laughs) (laughs) Would it just be instrumentals? Like, like yeah, piano. instrumentals, yeah. Okay. Like instrumental piano, like Bach, Mozart, like classics, okay. which is, I think, where I like the kind of cinematic minor key vibes. Um, in terms of artists, like I think Radiohead, I love Radiohead. Um, definitely influenced by them. All, all albums or was there one particular album that really stuck out um, to you? In Rainbows, I think. Mm-hmm. And... But at the same time, yeah, I think they they bring like this kind of combination of light and dark in this very unique way that I was always super drawn to. Um, also love artists like Fiona Apple, yeah, Alanis Morissette, um, Tori Amos, kind of like the 90s girl rock. <laughs> yes, I love that album, Under the Pink. It's such a... Oh such a great record okay. for just like just pure songs and the piano was just so like just present and and that the vocal was so the mix was so good in that and the fiona apple apple album that came out right around the same time uh so so good just uh, just amazing acoustics in there amazing mix i agree totally um but i'd say more recently like florence and the machine if you know them mm-hmm. i really like their music and but I'd say, yeah, I think 
I like to bring this like orchestral elements in, which definitely came from the, the classical music background. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's amazing. That's why we work so well together because you're, you're speaking my language right now. Just, you know, all these cool, dark, ethereal sounds with orchestral uh, elements that are in there and uh, just almost very cinematic um, in, in, exactly. in, in the production style. Yeah. I love all that stuff as well. So I know, great. You're so good at it. That's why no. I love working with you too. Well, thank you. I owe you more money now. Uh, but but <laughs> I, I just remember having these conversations with you where it was like, what if it was this mixed with that? And, and, uh, and I just remember, you know, us throwing references back and forth and we were never saying, Hmm, not so sure about that. It was always just like, yes, I love that. I love that too. It's, it's great. Really, really a, a good, good collaboration that it was working with you for sure. And, and we'll continue to collaborate with you as well. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'm looking forward to what the future is, is uh, going to hold for you because you have so much more music in you. You have so much more subject matter that you want to cover. Um, I can't wait to hear the, 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 the next material that, that you're going to come out with. It's all very exciting. And I just think your story is just beginning, even though you're getting all these you know, finalists, semi-finalists, I think it's just a matter of time before you are winning these songwriting competitions. And, you know, it's going from 500,000 streams into 10 million streams. It's just, I think it's really going to start blowing up for you. Absolutely. I just think this is the beginning. Oh my gosh. You're going to make me cry this early in the morning. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. You're, you're three hours behind me on West Coast time. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much. And I'm so grateful to to you and just to like, there's so many people that when you are an artist that kind of make it possible. And number one, the mentors that you have, like you and others, and just like the support of my family has been amazing, but also the people that connect to my music. Like I actually do live streaming on Twitch um, a couple times a week. And that's another thing in terms of the performance that I'm able to really perform actually like 12, nine to 12 hours a week on Twitch, which has been an amazing experience. That's, that's so great for just like all the other live performances that you're going to do just being on Twitch and, and just being there and communicating with people and, and knowing how to, how to talk between songs as well and, and keep people entertained because with Twitch, you can't see the people, right? You can't see them at yeah. all. It's just you looking into a camera. <laughs> yes. You sadly looking at your own face, but Luckily, you can see like their little, the, the chat and the emojis that they put up. So it does give you the sense of connection. But yeah, it's definitely not. It's it's less scary than being on a stage. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit more like a practice round. And but people on Twitch are so supportive. Like I've had whole songs funded by people on Twitch. And as an artist, like that means the world because you're just like, Hey, I'm putting myself out there and I don't know what I'm doing. I'm feeling vulnerable and terrified. And when people say like, I believe in you, I believe in your art, it helps you keep going, you know, because ultimately the journey of an artist is, is challenging and it's terrifying. You're always exposing yourself. You're having to make it in this very difficult business and you're having to make it in a male dominated, you know, industry if you're a woman mm -hmm. and just having people believe in you and keep going, I think, or it helps you keep going and gives you faith that you should keep pursuing this and gives you more confidence. Yeah, absolutely. Boy, I can't wait for a time when it is not male dominated. I can't wait for a time when it is 50 50, when anybody who wants to do this can do it with, with no issues whatsoever. Um, I think it's coming, but I think there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done for sure. <laughs> in order to make that, you know, successful. Um, I just can't wait for that time. I, I can't wait till studios are, are run by women. I can't wait, wait, wait until there are just female only studios, you know, where, where it's just women can go and work there and not feel any weirdness at all and be able to work until three in the morning and, and not have, you know, just, yeah, just crazy stories that I've heard uh, about the industry and how it all works and, and everything, but it just, a lot needs to change. That's for sure. Yeah, no, exactly. I agree. And luckily there are some nonprofits like Women's Audio Mission that does just that, um, which is amazing. But yeah, ultimately, what is it like 3.5% of um, engineers, 2% of producers, 12% yeah. of songwriters, like the statistics are just outlandish. Yeah. And it's really, I mean, I so appreciate you 
wanting to shine a light on this and creating this podcast because we need male allies to yeah. speak out for yeah. it and help make the change. Like it can't just be all on women to, of course. to do that. It has to be everyone. And I truly believe that everyone will benefit if that happens, you know, it's oh, not for just sure. a competition. It's about rising everybody up when there is equity. Yeah. It's not a competition at all at all is it's just it's just giving everyone an equal chance and an equal voice and and equal opportunity to to do this thing that we all love doing you know it's just let's let's all make it so that everybody can make a great career and a great time and a positive experience for for everybody there should be no negativity throughout making music it should all just be fun and and great and and glorious that's kind of the world i grew up in is, is i you know i remember as a kid watching this show uh, in Canada that came out of Ontario, Hamilton, Ontario, it was called Tiny Talent Time. And mm -hmm. it was just mm -hmm. these kids that would go on and they would play. And uh, there would be somebody there that would, you know, boys and girls that would just, the, the, the host would just, there was no judging afterwards. It was just always oh, just, that was great. I really hope that you, you know, enjoyed yourself playing. It just seemed like a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And, and that's sort of what I thought the music industry was going to be just a lot of fun and, and all that. But it's just, there's so many layers of crap that's out there that just needs to be completely demolished and just, and just make it all about people creating the kind of art that they want to create in however way that they see it being created. And, and there should be no barriers. There should be no, no, uh, there should be nothing to stop anybody from, from creating the, the beautiful art that they're, that they're meant to create while they're here on this planet. I agree so much and i guess that's part of what you know i'm glad you had that experience because it get it gave you this foundation that then you can bring to the artists that you're working with and anybody that you talk to about it that that is a possibility you know we can create that we can change the culture and it's possible you know mm -hmm. because i think if we don't believe it's possible then it won't change mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely Tess, what would you say is a typical day for you in your career? Like what, what are some of the things that you do in the morning, the afternoon, the evening? Just, you don't have to give me every single detail, but just like what, what are some things that, that you do as an artist, as a songwriter, um, as somebody that prepares to be creative throughout the day? Yeah, I think I maybe separate it into a couple of different buckets. So I'll give you the example of yesterday. Um, there's kind of the performance aspect, which I do both live and on Twitch. So yesterday I had a Twitch stream. So I spent about two and a half hours online doing my Twitch stream, which is amazing. About 30 minutes or so kind of preparing for that, warming up my voice, um, getting into the right headspace, preparing my songs, doing all the tech specs to get that ready. Then I'd say there's like the creative, which for me, I like to set aside at least two hours if I'm going to be writing or something, because if I'm like, oh, I have 30 minutes, it's hard to get into that zone. So really carving out that time, whether I'm like working on a lyric or practicing a part even, or I'm just trying to figure out the arrangement, maybe playing around with some ideas on the piano or just writing songs. Um, then I would say there's like, the music business side of things like doing my taxes which i was working on or you know um whatever it is like emailing venues try to get shows or just any of the admin stuff um there's a whole like music is a business and a lot of people think oh you're just writing songs you're performing but actually there's a lot that you have to do to run your business and make it successful mm -hmm. so the last bucket i would say is like um, connecting with their community. So that's so huge. And I think that's part of why what has worked for me has, because I take the time to not think about the numbers exactly, but think about like each person as a person that's listening to my music. So I take some time to try to connect on like Instagram or my, I have a private Facebook group for my community. I have a discord group and really just like posting, hey, how's it going? Or maybe I'll share some photos, asking, talking one-on-one -on -one with people, sending out an email. Um, so that that's really important because you're kind of nurturing this community of, of people who will then support you. Like I have a Patreon group, I have the Twitch. 
And so a lot of time needs to be spent supporting those groups as well. So that's the basics. I also try to like meditate um, to get my head in the right zone every day and try to take a walk or get some kind of exercise because that's so important for like your mental health and just not getting overwhelmed by all of the different things you have to do. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Being an artist isn't just about singing. There, there's so much more to it than, than that. The business side, the reaching out to your fans, all of that. It's, it's, it's very important to hear that coming from you, that it isn't just, you know, you getting up on stage or you performing on Twitch. There's so much more that goes into preparing for all that. And then just keeping the fans there and keep, keep, you know, generating new fans as well. And, and, uh, and, and more activity and all of that. It just seems like it, uh, it'll just keep ramping up, but just, has it been sort of like a slow, steady climb into that? Or did it all of a sudden just happen right away that just, boom, you had to start doing this? Um, yeah, I think it sort of was a steady climb of figuring it out. Cause there's so many different things about the music industry now than what was true in the past. Like now we can, you know, have a Patreon group and set that up. And so each way along this path, I've had to figure out new things and new ways that work. And it's a lot of like experimentation, sort of like any startup in a way of like, okay, people really like this. So I'm going to go with that. Like, turns out live streaming is really fun for me and I'm really enjoying it. So I'm going to like invest more time into that. Um, songwriting, I, you know, I didn't know starting out that that was going to be like the thing that I wanted to invest so much in. So I'd say, yeah, it's, it's sort of a slow build because you're, you're learning what works and then you're seeing what are you good at it as well and how do you invest more in that and then building a team around you of people that complement your skill set, mm -hmm. like work, finding people to work with like you, um, you know, working with other musicians, working with other co-writers. Um, finding people that have different strengths so that together you can make something even better. Amazing. Amazing. Oh, that's such good information. It's great. And I love that you're doing like the majority of this yourself. Um, it's a lot of hard work, but you're obviously able to do it and, and able to figure it all out. And, uh, but you do have some people that, that you join forces with, of course. Uh, yes. but I think really though, the majority you're, you're on the ground running and, and doing a lot of this yourself and kudos to you for making it successful and not being buried by all the, all the amount of work that it is. You're doing a great job for sure. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, no, it is a lot of work, but I definitely think, yeah, having people around to help you building your team when the time is right is so important and critical. Um, but you also have to know yourself first because nobody else can. And that's what writes such a problem in the music industry is like artists giving away X, Y, Z or kind of being taken over by these different competing interests. And it's like, I think coming to it for me as like, like a little bit later in life, like I didn't start pursuing it when I was 12 <laughs> mm -hmm. has given me more uh, self confidence, self knowledge, self awareness that I'm not going to fall prey to those things. You know, I'm going to be my own boss and be my own CEO and focus on everything that I need to do. I really want to be respectful of your time. Um, and I appreciate everything that you've been talking to me about so far. Uh, just one last thing, Tess, if that's all right. Of course. I'd love to know if you have any advice to give to uh, the next generation of females or those that identify as female that would love to get into the industry, to be the next Tess Posner, um, <laughs> to be a singer, songwriter, artist, um, performing artist, recording artist, Twitch artist, um, all of that, just any advice that you have would be great to hear. Please and thank you. Yeah, of course. Well, I definitely say be true to yourself first. I spent so much time at the beginning just writing and getting to know myself really. Like, what do I care about? What is my artistic vision? And having clarity about that and self-awareness and self-confidence in that really helps you because being an artist is scary. Like we've talked about you're you might get rejection a lot. You might get negative comments. You might, who knows what people's reaction will be to your art. But you have to get to the point in yourself where you don't care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, or you might care a little bit, but ultimately you're doing this. You know why you're doing this. 
And you're clear about that. And I think that's really, really important that no one can define it for you except yourself. Just make something that you love and that you care about and that you think is a masterpiece. And it doesn't matter whether other people think that because that's really all we have control over. We can't control what other people are going to think. And I think as a budding artist, that's one thing that's really scary is like, oh, what are people going to think? Um, is, is everyone going to like this? Is everyone going to like me? And setting that aside and also getting like clarity on why, why are you doing this? What is driving you? Because I think it's a lot of artists, it's like a mission. We can't do anything else. <laughs> we can only do this. And getting clear on why that is so that when people doubt you or, you know, try to question your dream, you know why you're doing it. And you can believe in that and believe in yourself and not have to, you know, pull that doubt inside. I, I've heard people give up on this, including myself, right? I mean, I was young. I was 12, 13 years old or maybe 14 when I got this you know, somebody questioning what I wanted. I wasn't old enough to know, hey, they're doing this because they had a bad experience. And so know that a lot of times what people's reaction is, is not about you. It's about them. It's about their dreams. It's about their creative expression. It's about their experiences. So if you can just remember that and really, you know, take a deep breath and kind of find, find your center and go back to why you're doing this. I think that will really help when you're getting started to find out who you are. And that helped me, you know, get clarity on what my artistic vision is, my brand, my sound, you know, my lyrical content, like all these things will be driven by that inner core of you. If you really tune into that outside of what the world may think. And I think the best art comes from those places. Um, the second thing I would say is just don't be afraid to to go there, like lean into what's hard, what's uncomfortable, what's difficult, because a lot of times that's the most real art that exists is when people really share what's the most scary to share. And rather than keeping it all polished and shiny, um, thinking, oh, this is what people want to hear. It's like, no, I'm so terrified to say this. <laughs> okay. There, now you're onto something. So lean into those things and then believe in yourself and your own power inside. And the journey will unfold in its own way, in its own time. You know, I could say a lot more, but I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> I wish you would, though, because it's so good. I love everything <laughs> you've just said. It's amazing. It's oh, amazing. Thanks. Create the art, though, that that really matters to you, first and foremost. You know, and yes, yes, you will always have your your naysayers out there. You'll always have the people that aren't feeling it. That's all good. That's that's what art should do. If, you, if I heard this great thing that said, if if everybody loves what you're doing, then you're not doing your job right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Art divides people. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You're gonna have some people that love it. You're gonna have some, a lot of people that hate it. And probably the majority of people are going to hate it, but there will be somebody eventually that will like it, that will tie into what you're doing and you will find your tribe, you will find your team of people. And then once you find those people like you do so well, reach out to them, keep them engaged, you know, let them know that they're important because without them, there is no project going on. You know, it, I mean, you can keep releasing stuff, but if you want to be successful at it, there has to be some sort of financial gain that's coming back. And that all comes from from fans that help support that and help support, you know, you carrying on and doing doing your dream. Ah, amazing. I love your words. So, mm -hmm. so good. Tess Posner, thank you so much. I could sit here and talk to you forever, but I know you've got a million things to do today and I, I don't want to take up more of your time with that. So thank you so much for being part of this podcast. And uh, I can't wait until we can... Uh, uh, meet again and uh, talk more and make some more music as well and uh, have a lot of fun doing it. Me too. It's always such a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for having me and for doing this podcast. I appreciate 
you wanting to highlight women in music and there's a lot more of that needed. So thank you for having me. My absolute pleasure. I'll be doing this hopefully until they are lowering me six feet under the ground. So <laughs> hopefully 50 to a hundred years from now, <laughs> Thousand, thousands of years. That's thousands right. I'll years. live forever. That's right. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Tess. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Take okay. care. Bye. Bye-bye. Stay tuned for the next episode of Women in the Music Industry, coming soon. Let's embark on this incredible journey together, celebrating the women who are reshaping the music business one note at a time. If you enjoyed hearing this podcast, please take a moment and give it a like, a rating, or a follow. Your support helps immensely. We'll see you next time.